Good evening, everybody, and thanks for being with us. The Marxist M efforts to interfere in this year's presidential election are now in full swing. President Trump has once again been forced back into a corrupt New York court to defend himself against a George Soros-sponsored district attorney, Marxist Dem DA Alvin Bragg, who's cooked up a case that is nothing more than a sham. Jury selection began today in the New York hush money case, as it's called, as if there's any chance that Donald Trump could get a fair trial in Marxist dim Manhattan jury pools. But this carnival of courtroom corruption is all about persecuting the former president and again rigging this presidential election. A conviction in this phony baloney case could very well mean the end of America's experiment with democracy, the end of our constitutional republic. And that is not hyperbole. Not that any of this will cause the fanatics of the Marxist Dems and Democrat Party, so-called, uh, even a moment of lost sleep to make the nation a post-constitutional banana republic. And the idiot puppet in the White House is setting fires all across the globe pushing this world ever closer to a world war. The Biden regime's national security mouthpiece, John Kirby, who, believe it or not, was once an admiral in the U.S. Navy, recently tried to pin the blame for Iran's attack on Israel on guess who? Former President Donald Trump. Could this administration have been tougher on Iran? Did it sense an opening? It's hard to look at what President Biden has done with respect, with respect to Iran and say that he hasn't been tough on Iran, that we haven't put uh, pressure on them, that we haven't addi additional 500 sanctions. Well, why last not night. support something have, that would have stopped that program well, or at least contained it in some way so it's not launching in Israel and we aren't having to get it involved defensively? Again, now. Shannon, just look at the, the sanctions that we put in place against Iran. Look at the resources we put in this in the, into the region. It's hard to take a look at what President Biden has done and say that we've somehow gone soft on, on Iran. It was the previous administration that decided to, to get us out of the Iran deal and now Iran is so much dramatically closer to a potential nuclear weapon capability than they were uh, before uh, before Mr. Trump was elected. Do you notice how earnest he seems? Uh, and then he does this thing with his head, and then he looks like he's got something stuck in his throat. And what is stuck in his throat are the lies that he keeps spewing out uh, in the name of the Biden administration. What honor for a former admiral of the U.S. Navy uh, to hold such a position and to spew such lies. But why not? Blaming President Trump for the never-ending disasters coming out of the Biden White House makes perfect sense to the Trump-hating Marxists. They were out in full force today, blocking traffic at the O'Hare Airport in Chicago. They were shouting, of course, free Palestine. They really mean, you know, free Hamas to kill uh, Israelis. Uh, this while Iran is threatening to obliterate uh, Israel and gave it a pretty good run over the weekend. They really mean let Hamas kill Israelis to their heart's content. No interference by, say, the Israelis. These radical Marxist and uh, radical Islamists should be shouting their vapid slogans from a jail cell. Where are the police? Not that these pro-Hamas thugs would ever be charged in the dim-run hellholes that we once called our great cities. And in Gaza, Hamas leading the shouting and the cheers as they got the news that Iran was bombing, attacking Israel. And joining us now to discuss Iran's attack on Israel, the escalating possibility of being drawn into a Middle Eastern war, joining us is Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee. Uh, this is an extraordinary moment, as, uh, as we all know, but to see uh, Iran have the temerity, the arrogance uh, to take on for the first time ever, directly attack Israel is astonishing. And I can't see how the Israelis can just ignore this as President Biden obviously wants them to. 
I agree, Lou. And I think you're seeing um, when the when the the drones and the missiles flew, I think you saw some of the Middle Eastern countries over there. Obviously, they know Iran's a bad actor. They don't. They know that's not in their their wheelhouse uh, to get in the middle of this thing. And I think that's why so many of them we um, we were well, that's why we knocked ninety nine percent of them down. You know, we had assistance from other countries, right. and um, and America, of course, took a, a a lead in that as we should. But also, I think you have to look at the the fact that this administration continuously, uh, you know, a wink and a nod to our enemies. What in the world were they doing alerting America, apparently, uh, via back door, but still in America telling them, you know, let's uh, let's keep it, you know, let's not let's not get out of control with this thing, um, you know. <laughs> It's just whose yeah, side I mean, are whose side is our White House on? Yeah, I, I'm. It's hard to answer that question when you see uh, Joe Biden go over to Beijing and uh, uh, bow and scrape and grovel before Xi Jinping. Uh, even right now, we we have the lowest level of oil in our strategic petroleum reserves because of this uh, this idiot puppet of a president. Uh, we are in no way prepared for a significant conflict of any kind because no. this this White House uh, is uh, out of its mind. Uh, they're, they're going after our allies. Uh, they're uh, coddling our enemies. Uh, it, it's, it's truly a remarkable moment in American history. It truly is, Lou, and you, you, you captured it pretty well. You know, Iran... Of course, the the two million, two and a half million barrels a day that they're allowed to crank out of the ground and primarily sell to China. If you remember under Trump, they were bankrupt. Iran was bankrupt, and people want to focus on the seven billion or whatever it was that we freed up, and that's that was a virtual drop in the bucket, no pun intended, when you add the oil. And um, and Trump had shut their oil down. He just said he embargoed. He, you know, he just he shut it down, and nobody would touch it, and they couldn't get it. And um, and it was and there was peace in the world. But you give those people the money. That's what they do. They start funding terrorists. And that's what they've done. And, um, uh, you know, if we if we don't stand with Israel on this, God help us, Lou. I just don't know if we'll I don't know where we'll be as a nation. Well, and we're at, uh, without question, the mercy of one Joe Biden, uh, mentally impaired, politically uh, corrupt. Uh, and uh, compromise with the Chinese and how many nations we don't know. Uh, it's a tough time uh, for uh, for Americans. One of the good things, though, that's come out of this is we're looking at a country that now the majority of the country says that this country is on the going on the going in the wrong direction uh, under uh, Joe Biden. Uh, there is a there's a a clear cry in the air for a change uh, to get rid of this fool in the White House and to bring in a real leader, and that is, of course, President Trump. Uh, I, I, happen to, I happen to find that inspiring uh, and hopeful. Well, Lou, you've been around a lot longer, well, not a lot longer, just you've been around a little longer than I have, and you've seen okay. America have strong leaders and weak leaders, and then what the response is from our enemies and our friends. And clearly, under this weak leadership, you've seen wars break out all over the world. And under Trump, where we had a strong leader, you didn't see that because they knew they feared him. They, you know, I've heard him say he's a cowboy, whatever. He just he he would respond to you remember what they did to Soleimani. They had to identify him by his ring finger because he had this unusual ring, and he was he was they just blew him up. And uh, right. no civilians lost their lives. No Americans lost their lives. He didn't ask the United Nations for permission. Uh, he didn't issue a press release and say, we're going to blow up an empty building. He took a terrorist out. And we don't have that type of leadership right now. Right now, we, mm -hmm. ask, we ask our enemies for permission. We try to fund both sides of conflicts. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it, it really doesn't work to have an idiot in the White House a man who should never have been there. The Marxist stems have a lot to answer for because they turned this government over to uh, a complete fool, uh, a man who is, as I've said, only a puppet 
He's doing what the Marxist Dems tell him and the uh, enemies of the, of, of the nation. Uh, to think that he coddles uh, Iran, uh, he uh, goes over and, as I said, you know, wants to sit in uh, uh, Xi Jinping's lap uh, as the puppet he is. It just goes on. Uh, and to think that uh, the national media is so owned by corporate America and, the Wall, and Wall Street that they won't even speak uh, honestly, won't even uh, seek uh, truth. Uh, in our in our political system, uh, in the swamp itself, it, do you think that'll ever change? Well, it's a it's a true hold your hold my beer moment for the media. You know, you think are they will they get any worse and a, any more obvious? I I I go back to the premise, Lou. Um, tell me what you think about it, but I think it's because they're so so in bed and they had so much invested in beating Donald Trump and putting this this mm -hmm. you know worthless human in the white house that they um they can't go back and um even though the polling numbers are showing showing where they're at um i just exactly. hope america wakes up and we get more than 15 percent of the the voting populace to the polls on election day yeah from your lips to god's ears we hope so with you i appreciate it congressman tim burchett as always thanks so much for being with us here on the show i look forward to our next uh, our next talk thank you sir Thank you, Lou, and thanks for always putting out the truth, brother. It is very refreshing. And Roger Stone is here next to take up the Trump political persecutions that have now entered a ninth straight year and a truly appalling new law in California on child sex trafficking. Uh, it's a law that, and a discussion that seems as perverse as the criminals the state Marxist Dems are protecting. That's straight ahead. Stay with us. And welcome back. The New York Times released a new poll. Now, remember, it was a New York Times poll they released over the weekend, showing President Donald Trump leading Joe Biden by 46 to 45. Now, that may seem to you not to be a big margin, but again, it's a New York Times poll. The new poll is marginally different than the one they released last month, showing Trump leading by five percentage points, 48 to 43, and as you might imagine, that previous poll caused such an uproar, again, amongst the radical left, the Marxist Dems, you know, Democrats. Respondents ranked Trump more positively on overall favorability, a notable reversal from Biden's 2020 advantage. 69% of voters see 81-year-old Joe Biden is too old. And meanwhile, the Marxist Dems are already hedging their chances by promoting conspiracy theories in case Trump wins again. A top Marxist Dem is arguing that Hillary Clinton wasn't elected president because of, are you ready for this, misinformation. Listen to this silly screwball conspiracy that Congressman James Clyburn, uh, well, sold off to MSNBC. I am still concerned because I've been around this business long enough to know that were it not for misinformation, uh, that Hillary Clinton would have been elected president of the United States, and I think all of us know that. There you have it, James Clyburn, with the, with the truth. Hillary Clinton pushed the Russia collusion hoax, trying, trying very hard to sabotage President Trump's campaign, and when that didn't work, and she lost despite that effort, by the way, working with the deep state, the entire federal government, the entire Obama administration, and their misinformation wouldn't penetrate. So she lost. But the very definition of misinformation is Hillary Clinton. I mean, she knows a thing or two about it. And it looks like they're trying to revive the conspiracy as well as the effort ahead of November 5th. The Marxist Dems sabotaged two straight presidential elections with crooked schemes, misinformation, abuse of power, and they're doing it again. Joining us now to talk about this and the political persecution of President Trump is former Trump senior advisor, also the author of Political Operative and host of The Stone Zone, 
Roger Stone. We appreciate you coming back and talking with us a little today. Uh, and you're looking great, if I may say. Thank you, Lou. I appreciate being here. Well, you you and me both, partner. Uh, let me uh, let me turn to uh, the president under full assault in the uh, den uh, of blue state iniquity, uh, the most corrupt judicial system outside of D.C. Uh, president Trump now facing the uh, the brilliant George Soros sponsored Alvin Bragg, Marxist dim persecutor. Uh, your thoughts on what uh, what this is all about? Uh, it's about election interference, and that's all it's about. I, I would point out that federal prosecutors from the Southern District of New York, one of the most aggressive and probably one of the most anti-Trump uh, units of the Department of Justice, thoroughly examined all of the issues pertaining to Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohn, and these issues, and they determined not to bring any prosecution, I think because they determined there was no case there. Then professional prosecutors in DA Alvin Bragg's own office recommended against bringing this case. Uh, but they seem determined, because they're trying to affect the outcome of a presidential election, to try President Trump somewhere for something, uh, even if they know that his conviction is flawed and will ultimately be overturned, certainly that wouldn't happen before the election. So they're desperate to have a trial, some trial, any trial, before the election. It turns out to be this one for sure. Uh, and uh, it, it's very interesting on a number of, of levels. I mean, first and foremost, even if Trump did the things that he's accused of, and that's not at all certain or proven, this would be a civil business records case. It would not be a criminal trial. Uh, then secondarily, you have the extraordinary conflicts and bias by this judge, Judge Juan Merchant. First of all, uh, he gave a contribution to Joe Biden's presidential campaign in violation of the judicial canon of ethics. He should have had the good sense to recuse himself after that became public, but he did not. Uh, we now learn that his adult daughter is a Democratic political operative and fundraiser, and that she's raised at least $93 million dollars uh, based on, off of this case, talking about this case in her in her solicitations. So that's an egregious conflict. She, the judge's daughter has a direct interest in the outcome or the continuation uh, of this trial. Mm -hmm. And then yesterday, Lou, and this is kind of shocking, on my 77 WABC radio show, I was interviewing uh, the criminal justice, pardon me, the criminal defense attorney, David Schoen, uh, who uh, represented President Trump in one of the impeachment trials in the U.S. Senate, very able right. guy, who told me uh, that Robert Costello, former federal prosecutor, respected criminal defense lawyer now in New York, who previously represented Michael Cohen, uh, told him uh, that he, Costello, had asked Cohen uh, prior to his own indictment, Cohen's own indictment, if you have anything on Donald Trump, now is the time. Tell me now. And he said that Cohn insisted both verbally and in over 300 emails that he had no evidence of wrongdoing by Trump. Uh, Schoen also said that Attorney Costello went to the grand, a federal grand jury investigating this matter and testified truthfully to this extent. Uh, yet Costello has not been called uh, by Trump's lawyers as a defense witness, uh, and um, no, pro no proffer has been made as to what his testimony would be. So I find that very strange. I don't know if it's an oversight, but it sounds like Attorney Costello, who's quite respected, could be a very strong witness uh, uh, in this case for President Trump and against uh, Michael Cohen. You know, I think that's right, Roger. And I've talked to uh, uh, Robert Costello, who, as you say, is a distinguished attorney, highly respected and well-known uh, attorney in uh, the in New York. Uh, and he was before that uh, brought in uh, to that grand jury. Uh, and he told our audience, point blank, that he was astonished at the information that the prosecutors were not insisting be brought forward. In fact, uh, were ignoring altogether 
evidence that he considered to be exp- uh, exculpatory, uh, and uh, he, and he just shook his head uh, at, at the way in which the prosecutors were proceeding. Uh, so you're exactly right, uh, and and to think that this is a, New York has to be the most corrupt judicial system outside of Washington D.C. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, I certainly would. I mean, we've already seen the so-called valuations case, which is an outrage. I mean, there is no victim in this case. It, Trump is tried under a law in which no one has ever ever been prosecuted. He borrowed money from banks. He put up collateral. The banks did their own independent appraisal of the value of that collateral. They decided to make the loan on the basis of the value of that collateral. They all got paid back on time. In fact, they made $40 million in interest on their loans. Who was harmed? Uh, who brought this complaint? What Was some bank bring? No, no, nobody brought the complaint. This was cooked up by, by Letitia James. Letitia James, who has gone from being worth uh, you know $113,000 to millions of dollars without explanation. Letitia James, who if you, if you go through her uh, filed contributor information, uh, has taken millions of dollars from people who literally allude do not exist, mm-hmm. or when you contact them because they've made multiple contributions to Letitia James, these people will tell you, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I think there's campaign finance fraud there. There may be personal uh, financial fraud there, yet she's prosecuting Trump for allegedly overvaluing certain assets when the banks did their own due diligence and appraisal anyway. Another example of how totally corrupt and totally politicized uh, the New York judicial system is. Now, it is a travesty and uh, and a reminder to everyone in New York, you know, Cyrus Vance, the previous uh, Manhattan DA, passed not once but twice on the idea of prosecuting despite the uh, desperate behest of the uh, Marxist Dem Party in New York. He refused to even touch this case, uh, yet uh, suddenly Alvin Bragg, who also initially uh, refused it, something, Roger, persuaded him. Uh, I'm not suggesting that he was blackmailed or that he was intimidated, but it would certainly be interesting to know why that change uh, in the assessment of the, uh, the prosecutability uh, of this uh, misdemeanor uh, suddenly changed, don't you think? Well, perhaps it is uh, uh, Mr. Bragg's patron, George Soros, uh, who called that to him. I mean, it is indisputable that he took a very large contribution to, from Soros to win this office. Uh, This is a travesty. It's an outrage that the president has to sit through this. But again, I think it's important to sit back and look at the big picture. The idea is to drain from Trump as many dollars as you can for his lawyers, drain his time from the campaign trail uh, and blacken his name because they fear that he's about to get reelected to the White House. And those fears, in my judgment, Roger, and I know yours, are well placed. Roger, thank you so much. We appreciate it as always. Roger Stone, great American and great friend. And turning now to more ugly crime, a nine-year-old girl punched in the face by an unhinged homeless thug in Grand Central Station in Manhattan. The attack wasn't captured on video somehow, but you can see the criminal roaming around the station. So new tonight, MTA police turning to the public for help after an unprovoked attack in broad daylight. It all happened inside a busy Grand Central this morning. Police say a nine-year-old was with her mom inside the dining hall when a man randomly approached them and punched that little girl in her face. And how often are we hearing this? Children being assaulted, women. Uh, This is an ugly crime wave because the victims are so vulnerable. And again, this thug in New York was able to to assault this young this young girl in broad daylight, and no one came to her aid in what was once considered one of the safest areas of New York City. Meanwhile, we continue to see illegal aliens committing awful crimes across the country. and Customs Enforcement arrested an illegal alien from Brazil over the weekend, who had previously been released back into the community after being indicted on 10 
counts of aggravated child rape. 10 counts of child rape. In Texas, 10 suspected illegal aliens were busted for child pornography at a human smuggling stash house. And the search was prompted after a tip from the Internet Crimes Against Children database, suggesting child pornography was downloaded at that location. Meanwhile, in California, these types of crimes are being normalized, and they have been for a number of years. Child sex trafficking is just a misdemeanor in the state of California. Think about that and watch. Right now, under California law, purchasing a child for sex is a misdemeanor crime. Republican State Senator Shannon Grove wants to change that and have it classified as a felony. As a misdemeanor right now, buyers can spend a maximum of one year behind bars plus a $10,000 fine. Grove's proposal, SB 1414, proposes to increase the punishment to a felony with up to four years in prison. She also proposes to have these buyers register as sex offenders for 10 years. Senator Grove says this will build off of her work from last year when state lawmakers changed the law to consider child sex trafficking a serious felony in California. This bill is supported by both Democrats and Republicans. And this is the Marxist dim future for America uh, that the Marxists all envision. If we don't put a stop to it with this election on November 5th, it could very well be our last chance to save this great nation, our constitutional republic. Coming up, will the Israelis retaliate against the Iranians? who launched an unprecedented assault directly against Israel. Stay with us for that and much more coming up. And join us on my podcast, The Great America Show, each day. We're, we'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. Do you remember that... Uh, Baltimore Key Bridge collapse. That was a few weeks ago, but it might as well have been ages ago in this insane news cycle that this country is in the grip of. That's when a Singapore uh, ship called the Dolly rammed into the Baltimore Bridge. That sent, of course, the entire massive structure crashing down uh, in just in seconds. Now, when some observers looked into it and concluded that it looks like it could have been caused by a cyber attack hijacking the vessel, that was a, well, almost a heretical statement. The Vanguard national media rushed to protect the narrative that it was just an accident and dismissed naysayers as conspiracy theorists. And now the Federal Bureau of Investigation is involved. The FBI has opened a criminal investigation focusing on the massive container ship that brought down the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore last month. The FBI said it didn't have any additional public information and wouldn't be commenting further, of course. And, of course, they didn't. They don't like to comment, especially about things that they actually know to be true. Uh, that's because getting the full truth out of Marxists is impossible, particularly if they're in the deep state. And here we are, three years after the January 6 demonstrations and riot. And remember, that's the riot when, when unarmed protesters killed exactly nobody. No one was killed by demonstrators or protesters. We are about to get testimony from National Guard service members that will leave the J6 members wondering if they're going to be indicted. It leaves the Democrats' anti-Trump insurrection narrative in shambles. That's because, as we knew all along, it was false. That's because Nancy Pelosi's pet J6 committee project conveniently left out the fact that the Secretary of the Army at the time, Ryan McCarthy, indeed got pre-authorization from President Donald Trump to deploy the National Guard. But he inexcusably waited two hours to give the go-ahead to the D.C. National Guard General William Walker. The J-6 cover-up committee's cover is blown. It's blown all but completely. 
their impeachment efforts against President Donald Trump, who again wanted security for the J6 election challenges, was a despicable fraud perpetrated against the American people, and it goes on now. And we have hundreds in the D.C. gulag, and some of them who haven't even had a trial to this point. Well, hopefully that will change quickly now. Turning to the big news of the day, the terrorist state of Iran unleashing about uh, 300 uh, drones and missiles and rockets. The uh, Israeli Defense Force appears to have in intercepted all of them except maybe one or two based on current reporting. And that's with a lot of help from the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, and, and Jordan. It's a grim reminder as well of how weakness begets mischief and sometimes mayhem. This may be the weakest presidency in American history. I don't know if there's any way to argue that in the other point. Uh, joining us now to talk about all of this is senior editor at the American Conservative, Dr. Samantra Maitra. I've got to turn to first and foremost of what looks like a, uh, a, a very, very, uh, well, I would say a pivotal moment in, in Middle East history. The first direct attack by Iran against the state of Israel, 99% of the 300 and some odd missiles and rockets and ballistic missiles that were launched by the Iranians uh, failed to hit their target, intercepted by uh, the, uh, the coalition, a small coalition, but a powerful one. 99% of those struck down. Uh, in the midst of this, there are reports that President Biden was actually giving guidance to the Iranians as they were unleashing, unleashing hell on, on Israel. Your, your thoughts? I think that's exactly right. I think there's a couple of things to understand from this highly choreographed kabuki that we just recently saw from, uh, from both sides. On one hand, as you rightly mentioned, this is the first time there has been an attack from the Iranian soil to the Israeli soil. Like if you go to history, the last time Persian attack was directed at the Holy Land was during the Sasanian Empire and uh, during the Byzantine Empire, and so that was like 1400 years back. So this is this is a very historic moment indeed. Uh, but interestingly, however, uh, a couple of things uh, to note from this episode was one, the Iranians started uh, to signal in what we use in international relations terms to the, to the Turkish uh, regime, uh, to the Arabs, uh, to the Arab loyalists, uh, and to Iraq and to the United States through their back channel, mentioning that they are going to attack Israel, which is unusual um, because, you know, they wanted to have some kind of back channel open with the Biden administration, somewhat deter uh, the Americans. The second thing that they did was they used subsonic drones, which takes six hours to travel from Iran to Israel. That is unusual. Again, if Iranians wanted to have like a full time war uh, with Israel, they would have probably started with asking their Hezbollah proxies to attack Israel right up above across the border from Lebanon. That didn't happen. So, the, so you, they used subsonic drones and then they used ballistic missiles uh, after the drones came and failed. Interestingly, as you mentioned, the Biden administration was constantly in touch with Iran. Uh, so there was this constant signaling going from both sides and back channels open to ensure that there is no direct attack, uh, and a direct war between Iran and, and the United States. Now, there are different thoughts and uh, ideas that one might use or ex to explain that thing. Uh, but yeah, I think I think there was a, there was a back channel that was open anyway. Well, is, isn't that absolutely, I mean, it's repulsive to think that the Biden administration, uh, having uh, suggested, uh, and I'm being facetious as I say that, basically ordered Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, not, not to in any way retaliate, uh, to uh, unilaterally uh, create a ceasefire with Hamas, uh, and to understand that if he did retaliate after this attack, uh, that the United States would not participate uh, in the defense of Israel. Uh, it yeah. is. Uh, it, it, this is an administration that is in and of itself unprecedented uh, in its iniquity, uh, in its uh, venal. Uh, disregard for our constitution, the, the republic uh, that this country is, uh, and the trampling of the rights that are ours as citizens 
and then to turn his back on the most important ally in the Middle East. This, this is breathtaking all in one, uh, one moment. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, to consume. It's difficult to digest. Yeah, I think I think there is a there is a uh, well. I, I mean, I I'd go. Uh, I wouldn't like want to bet my career on that, but there is a plausible explanation as to why the Biden administration is doing this. Number one, they are facing internal pollings to show that a significant part of their coalition, the the Arab and the and the Afghan and the Muslim and the Somalian you know crowd that is in the Democratic coalition, is opposed to anything to do with Israel. So they are facing some kind of domestic issues in both Michigan and Minnesota and other places where they thought they're just going to go and win the election. So that is obviously in some ways affecting the calculus of the Biden regime. The second, uh, the Biden administration's foreign policy is fundamentally incoherent in the sense on one hand, they want to have a broadly peaceful Middle East where they can come out of Middle East and focus on, on Europe or Russia somewhere. Second, they want to have a detente with Iran. Now, the problem with that is, on one hand, they want that, but on the second hand, they also absolutely despise the Abraham Accords that Trump administration did between uh, having this alignment between the, the Arab countries and Israel. They're fundamentally opposed to Israeli you know, rights and Israeli existence. If you talk to Israeli right wingers, for example, they're very much opposed to the Biden administration because they think that we are essentially tying their hands against their war in Gaza and against their war against the Hezbollah. So on one hand, the Biden administration wants to have some kind of like a detente with Iran, come out of the Middle East, have to have a broadly, you know, a, a democratic coalition that is existing in this country to go and work out, turn out and vote for, for the next president in the next election. But on the other hand, they also want to stop Israelis having a broadly peaceful coalition with the Arabs opposed to the Iranians. And that is not coherent anyway. Yeah, you, you know, as you, you know, as I uh, deconstruct uh, the apparatus that you've shared with us, uh, we're talking about administration that is led by a man who's cognitively impaired, politically right. compromised. Uh, he is, whether he knows it or not, a lame, uh, a, a lame puppet. Uh, there is no way he is going to win this election except by uh, the most uh, crooked imaginings uh, possible on the part of the Marxist Dems party and their, uh, and their uh, apparatchik. There is in this no rationale at all. This is a man who is pushing us toward uh, war, uh, uh, in putting our boots on the ground. I mean, we've been threatened with that already by this regime. Uh, if we do not give more money to Ukraine, this is a man who has turned over 2000 miles of our border to a to the Mexican drug cartels, and I mean right. deliberate it uh, with, and, and I don't know if there is a ten percent cut for the big guy in that, but I do know this: a lot of Americans uh, in in political power are benefiting through that partnership with the the Mexican drug cartels. Uh, this is not a rational group of people. They are anti-American. They're anti-democracy. Uh, they're anti-constitutional republic. They're anti-Christian. They're anti-Jew. They are anti, uh, without any question, Israel. What are we to make of it uh, and if, uh, if anything other than uh, this is uh, this is an administration of heinous Marxist Dems who mean us nothing but evil. I think I think you just you you absolutely rightly pointed out when you mentioned that you know the administration's policies are not really rational. I think that explains most of the things. Look, Biden, as you mentioned, he's he's cognitively not. Look, he never was the brightest crayon in the box, but at least he was uh, confident in what he was talking about. I don't think he's actually capable of understanding how his administration's being run. Like he has difference within his cabinet about how to approach the various issues when it comes to Mexico and, and drug cartels and, and Israel. But you, and but you say that, doctor, you say that, if I may, as if there is a rational structure around even his cabinet. Uh, these are uh, these are th these are the, the, the people who make up that cabinet are frankly third tier. And I'm talking about if you were in the third grade, you know, they would be outside the lines all the time. 
Uh, they have no knowledge base whatsoever. They have only a commitment to an ideology uh, and to uh, a lifestyle uh, that is perverse. Uh, I, I can't think of an exception on that cabinet. Can you? No, I, t I totally. Dis I mean, t I totally agree with you. I, I think I think yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, the quality of of people uh, surrounding him is fundamentally um, aligned to this progressive ideology and uh, and the perpetuation of that ideology, both you know at home and abroad. That's one of the reasons why you know they find fascists in Florida, for example. You know, without you know without looking at the southern border. You know, the, right. the American people wants to spend money. And when they say like, we are the isolationists, we're not isolationists, we want to go to war with the drug cartels. They're not going to do that. Yeah. You know, so I mean, that, that's one of the key things to consider in this question. It's like, you know, what their ideology is. And you're absolutely right about that. I think Kierkegaard said it. If you want to destroy, first you try to understand the individual. Uh, and uh, in this case, we're talking about the Biden regime. Uh, and believe right. me, I would like nothing better than to see it dismantled immediately and forthwith. But we'll have to wait a few months. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Samantra. Uh, we, Dr. Samantra Maitra, we appreciate it so much. And we, uh, again, appreciate your patience. I know you had to wait a bit uh, for us to begin here. And I thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute thank pleasure. You. Well, turning now to Christians under attack, not only in America by the Biden regime, but also around the world. We have to warn you, some of this is graphic. In Sydney, Australia this weekend, Bishop Mar Mari Emanuel was stabbed while he was giving a service. Both he and the attacker were taken to separate hospitals. Reports said that a mob formed to get revenge on the attacker yelling an eye for an eye. And that followed shortly upon a horrific attack at a Sydney mall, which left six dead, a mother whose nine-month-old was subsequently stabbed as well, but appears will survive. That's in Australia, where the government started taking away everyone's guns back in 1996. What a happy paradise Australia is now. And why would you not want a gun? So terror is spreading and spreading around the world again, thanks to the weakness of Joe Biden and the Biden Marxist M regime. Coming up, we've got a Hollywood loon that has really gone too far. Now they're calls to boycott his popular show on Amazon. You won't believe this cute son of a gun. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Reacher, uh, a terrific series on Amazon. The lead actor is a guy named Alan Richon. For some reason, he launched a hysterical tirade against President Trump. Now, that's what you really want from every actor, to share his or her brilliant knowledge of politics and history and nuanced strategic uh, values for any campaign. Uh, Richon called President Trump a rapist and a con man, end quote. Richon also said he can't understand why Christians support Trump. You know, this tells you how smart the guy is. It also tells you how, uh, well, just plain ignorant he is. The why is simple and straightforward. President Trump defends Christians and advances policies that align with their values, and he insists on faith being in our public square in the political arena. And he has been exactly right on, the, on that issue since 2015 when he decided to enter the race for president. Biden, on the other hand, makes it a point to persecute all Christians, all Jews, all Israelis. And turning now to an update on Claudine Gay, the disgraced former president of Harvard University. Uh, this is an incredible story when you think about it. Harvard is the oldest university in the United States. 1636, it was founded. It has one of the most distinguished uh, histories of any university, in my opinion, in the world. Gay humiliated Harvard and herself as president of Harvard when it came out that she has a long history of plagiarism. Now Gay will be teaching, are you ready for this? A course called Reading and Research Ethics. I'm going to say that again. 
Reading and Research Ethics. This will be taught by a plagiarist. The next thing you will uh, probably hear is that she's going to talk about uh, uh, racial and ethnic and national uh, sensitivity uh, because of her bigotry toward Jews and Israelis. You heard that right. The fraud is teaching ethics policy, ethics that she's been breaking throughout her career. She is the same woman who bumbled Harvard's response to Hamas sympathizers after the October 7th massacre in Israel. Watch this, if you will. Uh, It's appalling. And our university embraces a commitment to free expression. That commitment extends even to views that many of us find objectionable, even outrageous. We do not punish or sanction people for expressing such views. Such views, including, of course, genocide, you know, uh, the the elimination of Israel. Absolutely repugnant and awful, awful has been the Harvard response. The Harvard Corporation uh, really needs a timeout uh, and an upbraiding uh, for just plain ignorance. They are not leading. Uh, they are uh, absolutely uh, contemptible in the way in which they have handled Gay's plagiarism, her bigotry, uh, and her rationalization, if you will. Uh, Harvard can do better and must, but uh, it apparently is going to take longer than I would have ever imagined to correct uh, these uh, these uh, soul-searing uh, decisions on the part of the Harvard leadership. Well, no one believes that conservative students aren't punished for their views at Harvard, nor would any conservative professor get the same kid gloves uh, treatment that Gay has received. And I just want to say how embarrassed I am uh, for Harvard uh, and for all who are supporting this kind of ignorance on the part of the leadership of Harvard. Hopefully that will all change soon. And now this, the Manhattan DA's office wants the court to impose, on top of everything else, a $1,000 sanction for each of President Trump's social media posts and order him to take them down or they'll throw him in jail. Uh, All of this brought to you by uh, Judge uh, Juan Merchant. Uh, Let me say this uh, again. there is no way you could get a fair trial in New York uh, judici- in the New York judiciary if, uh, if, if the sun came up uh, in the West. Joining us now to react to all of this and much more is independent journalist Matt Taibbi. And Matt, great to have you here with us. Uh, and what a time, what a time we're in uh, to look at a president who is now uh, in the uh, who is captured by the Marxist Dems and the most corrupt judicial system outside of Washington, D.C., uh, that is New York. Uh, they're going to try to hold him in that uh, in that uh, sham trial for six to eight weeks, keep him off the campaign trail, that is their design, and then make someone somehow uh, believe that the, these, these sham charges are worthwhile and somehow amount to a felony uh, that would cost him a year of his life. Uh, your reaction to it all? Well, I think the, the the first trial is the one that was most obviously politicized. I think if you polled uh, prosecutors around the country you, and defense attorneys, they would say this is the one that has the least legal foundation to it. Uh, you know, they had to really create a sort of Frankenstein's monster of a charge even to get this thing into court. Um, you know, the, the, the other issues arguably are, you know, there, there are things that you can actually argue in court. This one is, it's just very difficult to see how they even brought this case. And um, I think it's going to end up being a politically a net negative uh, for Democrats that this thing even went to trial. This the first one. And, yeah, I, I, th- I don't know that I can see any one of these uh, prosecutions uh, up and down the eastern seaboard, all with Marxist activist DAs, all loved by George Soros. I, I frankly can't see one of them, uh, at least in the state courts, uh, surviving. Uh, there are the federal cases and the special counsels, uh, because that gets more complicated and more difficult to get to justice, in my opinion. Uh, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I don't I don't know enough about the relationship between any of these prosecutors and, you know, any hedge fund people like George Fort Soros, but uh I, I you know I, I do think that some of these cases are mo- much more obviously politically motivated than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that's troubled me about the entire Trump era, uh, as somebody who never in his life voted Republican, has been mm-hmm. the uh, really sort of casual use of extremely draconian laws like uh, the Espionage Act and um, and the and the Klan Act. And then the Klan Act is, is, doesn't really come into play in any of these suits, but did come into play in some uh, lawsuits and uh, the uh, and then the Insurrection Act business about trying to put them on the ballot. Um, but the Espionage Act is an incredibly dangerous law that carries extremely heavy penalties for things that are entirely subjective and are very hard to defend. Uh, it's in a very authoritarian uh, law just to begin with. Uh, and, you know, using it against a political opponent is, you know, I, I used to live in a third world country. I lived in post-communist Russia. I lived in Uzbekistan. Um, it, it, this is the kind of thing that you would see typically in kind of a tin pot third world country. Yeah. And it, it's become something of a, of a saw to talk about third world countries right now in the United States. But this all seems to be part of a of a journey that this nation is on right now, away from its destiny uh, and away from its uh, heritage uh, and history, we are wa- we are watching a border that's wide open to two thousand miles that are now controlled by the uh, Mexican drug cartels. Uh, the Chinese nationals are pouring across uh, the border uh, by the tens of thousands, and particularly uh, military age males. To what purpose? We are watching also the same happen uh, amongst the millions uh, of illegal aliens that that President Biden's regime has invited into the country over the last almost three and a half years. Uh, It is stunning stuff to watch the transformation, I will use Obama's words, the fundamental transformation of the United States uh, from 2008 to this date today. Uh, We are looking at uh, a a country that is losing its shape, its form, its foundation, and and its aspirations. Uh, We are looking at uh, public schools that were once the envy of the world because those public schools were the greatest equalizer in our society, in our economy, in our nation. And uh, the middle class dreams were were born and and, uh, succeeded there. It, it's just right now we have teachers who hate students, students who are fearful of their teachers and their parents. We have parents who are fearful of, of neighbors uh, and even the political party to which they belong because they don't understand them. And we have an administration that is warring against Christians and Jews. I mean, how much, how much, uh, how, how could we possibly be any sicker in your opinion? Well, I, I, you know, having covered uh, presidential campaigns going back to 2004, I started to notice um, probably by 2008, there was a kind of a growing sense of despair and anger really towards both parties. But I think there was particular disappointment toward the Democratic Party about the hollowing out of sort of traditional middle class aspirations uh you know the old idea that if you worked hard and followed the rules that you'd be able to buy a house uh accumulate Mm -hmm. enough money to to put you know put down a down payment raise a family live in a safe neighborhood uh you know for a lot of people that's a fantasy uh people coming out of college now one of the reasons i think that a lot of them have some ideas that seem crazy to uh you know you know from, from the outside is that they're so completely demoralized uh, and don't see any future where they're going to be able to have a normal family life, buy a house, any of those things. And I think that's a significant difference even from my generation. Like, you know, yeah, it is. Uh, you know, even for people in, you know, Generation X, 
uh, we saw it as, well, maybe we can get to our 30s and, and that can happen. I don't think people who come out of school now see that as happening at all. And there's a tension also between the entire kind of globalist project, which is let's, let's sort of uh, wash away the, uh, the borders uh, of industrialized countries, let's export labor to cheaper labor markets, and there'll be all this displacement and you'll have people who lived in like rust belt states where 10 years ago or 15 20 years ago they were making 30 dollars an hour in good jobs and they could buy a house and have a little swimming pool and maybe you know uh, go away on vacation every now and then now all those jobs are gone they're in mexico or in china and it's had a tremendous impact on american life yeah yeah I, I, I agree with you, and uh, and that may surprise some people. I don't know, but I agree with Matt Tidy on that, uh, and very much so. I, as a matter of fact, I, I, I've, I've been writing about that very issue, uh, the war on the middle class, exporting America, the offshoring of jobs, the offshoring, uh, the outsourcing of uh, jobs, the uh, offshoring of American manufacturing. Uh, when we look at what has occurred in this, there's one echo that uh, comes out of the early 2000s that I hear over and over every week, and that is there are jobs Americans won't do, said George W. Bush, and he proceeded to be the lackey for corporate America in this country and Wall Street. And with that, tremendous changes have ensued. I'm not saying that's the beginning of what has been a disaffection, a disorientation, and a polarization in our society, but it's much of it. Matt, I'd love to continue this conversation. Come back as soon as you can. Uh, the invitation is wide open. Whenever you feel like uh, picking up uh, the conversation or taking it somewhere else, bring it here. And we'll, we're delighted to have you with us in nature. Matt Taibbi, thanks, thanks so thanks much. Thanks a lot, Lou. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thanks to Matt Taibbi, and uh, please join us for my podcast, The Great America Show, at loudobs.com, wherever you get your podcasts. We thank you for being with us, and tomorrow at 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 Central, same time, same place, Missouri's Attorney General Andrew Bailey, one of the finest in the country, will be with us tomorrow, as well as Congressman Paul Gosar of Arizona. The Lindell Report is coming up next. Please join Mike. Good night, and God bless you. In the heart of Las Vegas on April 17th, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association invites you to a day of enlightenment and action. Join us at the Ahern Luxury